There were three April fools who found themselves standing before St. Peter at the pearly gates. He said, gentlemen, I just have one question to ask you, and if you can answer this question correctly, then I'm going to let you in to heaven. They said, well, what's the question? Three words. What is Easter? Woo, hand went right up. The first fool says, I know all about Easter. I can answer this question, no problem. Easter is a holiday that we celebrate in November where we sit down and we have turkey and ham and stuffing and sweet potatoes and pumpkin pie. We watch football and take naps. That is Easter. Wrong. The second one's looking at him, just shaking his head going, you are such a fool. I can tell you all about Easter, St. Peter. Easter is a holiday that we celebrate in December where we have Christmas trees and lights on the house and ornaments and gifts, and we're remembering the birth of Jesus. Now, that's Easter. Wrong. The third guy's going, you guys are really, really foolish. St. Peter, I got this under control. Easter is a Christian holiday that coincides with the Jewish Passover. Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples. He was betrayed. He was arrested. He was tried. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was crucified. He died. He was placed in a tomb, and a stone was rolled over the entrance, and he was locked away inside. And St. Peter's going, finally, somebody knows the story. And then the man continues. He says, but then something else happened after that i got to think about what it was. Hold on, I've almost got the next part. Let me think. Jesus died. Tomb. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. So now, every year, we go to the tomb and roll the stone away, and then Jesus comes out. And if he sees his Shadow, we get six more weeks of winter. Wrong. Let me be very clear, there's nothing funny about the crucifixion. There's nothing funny about what Jesus walked through for us. But isn't it kind of funny how this happened over 2,000 years ago, and yet there are still people in our lives, in our church, in our family, in our city, in our world, who really have absolutely no idea how to answer the question, what is Easter really all about? So if you want to get an honest opinion, one way to go about doing that is to ask a child, because many times children haven't had their filters developed quite yet, and so they will tell you exactly what they know or what they believe. Southland Christian Church interviewed some of their kids, and they asked them, can you tell us what Easter is all about And they made this little video to go with it. (laughs) After Jesus died, they put Jesus in a tomb and wrapped him with some white paper. They put a big stone around it and placed guards in front of the tomb to let nobody go in. He was just waiting for the three days. He's probably drinking soda while eating hot Cheetos. <laughs> he would probably play games like Candyland and then have a party by himself. <laughs> the okay. Easter Bunny was hiding behind a tree. <laughs> he probably went out there and just throw eggs everywhere. And then he's going to say, there's one money egg, so you better find it. You can get some money. Three days later, there was a big earthquake. (laughs) I think we should go away somewhere safe. It's like I'm getting out of here. The earth is shaking. Run for your lives. (laughs) And the guards ran off because they got scared. And then on Sunday, Mary and some of her friends came with some spices. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. His clothes only was there. Then an angel came and said, don't be afraid. Jesus has risen from the dead. Go tell the, go tell 
everyone, go tell the good news. Mary and her friends went and told the disciples. She said, Jesus has risen from the dead. Guys, guys, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples didn't believe them. No, that couldn't happen. Jesus can't raise from the dead. Uh, I don't believe it until I see it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus just came, just was there. I am Jesus. I am the. I'm the. I am the Son of the Lord God, and I am Jesus, your friend. And then the disciples said, "Jesus, it's you!" Yay! Jesus is alive. Totes cool. Jesus, before he left to heaven, he said, "I have done what I have come to do." And then he risen. Then he was going up to heaven. His disciples were crowded around him. The disciples said, "Holy guacamole! I can't believe Jesus really flew. That's awesome." Now what? Let's go tell the news. So, so one of the three fools had part of the story right, and some of the things that the kids said they had right, but we want to get the whole story. So where do we find the truth about the meaning of Easter? We look in God's Word. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28. There are Bibles in front of you in the pews, maybe in the chairs, or of course our scriptures will be on our stage here on our screens. Matthew 28. One through 20. Today we're going to begin a five-week series called The Resurrection Road. We're going to begin with the resurrection of Christ, and then we're going to work our way back over the next five weeks to the Garden of Gethsemane. So today I want to share three things with you about the resurrection road, which answers the question, what is Easter all about? Matthew 28, we'll start in verse 1, our first point. We have to look at the realistic route. A few weeks ago, my wife and I embarked on the adventure, adventure of painting the exterior of our home. And very quickly, when you embark on this adventure, you learn three things right away. It costs a lot more money than you anticipated. It takes a lot longer than you thought. And you use a lot more paint than you ever thought possible. So we are on day one. We are prepping. We are scraping, and we are sanding, and we are caulking. And I have about as much skill with a caulk gun as I do with a tube of toothpaste. It was not pretty, but it was effective, okay? We covered it up. So we're getting ready to start painting. My wife's on the roof because she has no fear. I have lots of fear. I'm not getting on the roof. She says, babe, I need a chisel and a piece of sandpaper, your wish is my command. I know where all those things are. So I go to the garage, I get the chisel, I get the sandpaper. And then I'm thinking to myself, now how am I going to get these to her? Because I don't want her to climb down the ladder, and I'm certainly not going up the ladder. So in my genius man brain, I take the chisel, and I wrap it in the sandpaper, you know, inside out. That way it's soft, doesn't mess anything up. And then I tape it together. So this way I have one solid unit with everything that she needs and I can just walk by and toss it up to her on the roof, okay? Great plan, super smart. So I walk by, I throw it up, I go back in the backyard, and two or three minutes later she comes up to me, and she's holding the chisel and the sandpaper in her hand, and she says, what exactly is this? And so here's a picture of what it looked like. So in my mind, what I expected her to see was he needed to get me a chisel and a piece of sandpaper. So he very cleverly taped those items together and then threw them up to me. He could be the smartest man alive. And yet, though that's what I expected, what she expected was for me to bring her a chisel and a piece of sandpaper. So when I bring her this device that is taped together and looks like some type of homemade tool, she thought I had lost my mind. So she comes down, she goes, what exactly am I supposed to do with this? I go, what do you mean? She goes, what do you want me to do with this? I go, you asked for a chisel and for sandpaper. I know, but what is this thing? It's a chisel and sandpaper. 
What's the tape for? So I didn't have to climb the ladder. Oh, I get it. It makes sense. Okay. Sometimes we expect one thing, but then the results or what we receive are completely different than what we expected. And that's what the women found when they went to the tomb. Let me set the scene. On Friday, Christ had been crucified. He was arrested. He was tried. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was whipped. A crown of thorns was pushed into his skull. Large Roman nails pierced his hands and his feet. No work could be done on the Sabbath. So as Friday, as the sun went down, they would often go and they would break the legs of those who were being crucified so they could no longer hold themselves up and they would asphyxiate so they could take them down. But Jesus had already breathed his last. He had says it is finished. They pulled him from the cross and they placed him in a tomb and they sealed it. Verse 1, Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went to see the tomb. Nothing could be done on Saturday, so first thing Sunday morning they awake. They take the spices and they're on the way to prepare the body of Jesus. And what they expected to find was Jesus' dead body inside of the tomb. Because he had died. It's not a trick. They saw him. He breathed his last. So what they expected to find was Jesus' body laying in a grave. That's not what they found. Verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. A great earthquake shook. And maybe that was at the appearance of the angel or maybe at the rolling away of the stone. And the angel sits upon the stone. He's like an appearance of lightning and snow. And the two guards, what do they do and how do they respond? Do they put their swords in the air and do they say, who are you and why are you here? State your name and state your purpose. No, it says they were so terrified that they were frozen like dead men, paralyzed with fear. These are war-hardened soldiers who were afraid of absolutely nothing, but they had never seen anything like this. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Christ who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, and he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. We have all been in a situation in our life where we walk into something and we expect one thing, but what we receive or what we see or what we experience is something totally different. I had friends one time ask us to help them move. And they said, now listen, we've got everything packed up. It's all in boxes. We just need help loading the boxes on the truck. So based on that information, I should expect to walk in and see boxes stacked in every room of their home. And I should take my dolly and load boxes and wheel them onto the truck. And yet I walked in and instead of finding boxes packed in the rooms, what I found was an episode of Hoarders Gone Wrong. And they had stuff stacked everywhere, all over the floor, all in the closets. I didn't even see a box in their house. And so what I expected did not happen. Can you imagine the conversation of these two women as they walked to the tomb? Mary, what are we going to do when we get there? We're going to anoint the body of Jesus. But the tomb is closed. How will we ever move the stone? We'll ask the soldiers. Maybe they'll do it for us. What if they say no? I don't know what we'll do. I just know that we're supposed to go there. Mary, I'm scared. I am too. I already miss Jesus. Me too. And so what they expect to see is guards standing outside a sealed tomb. And instead, when they walk up, what they see is an open tomb, two paralyzed, frozen in fear guards looking like dead men, and an angel sitting on top of the stone waving at them. What do you say when you walk up on something like that? Okay, Two guards frozen like dead men, the stones rolled away, and an angel 
with the appearance of lightning and snow is sitting there looking at you. Hey, I'm Mary. This is Mary too. What are y'all doing? It's kind of weird. What do you say to something like that? Everything in my mind, all the way they walk, they're thinking, Jesus, tomb, dead body, anoint my Savior. Will we even be able to get in and they walk up and there's an angel sitting on top of the stone and the soldiers are frozen like dead men? What do you say in a moment like that? I don't think that they said anything at all. The angel speaks to them and he says, do not be afraid. I know you've come here to see Jesus, but he's not here. Where is he at? He is risen. You mean like somebody picked his body up and took him out of here? No, 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 he's alive. Come and see for yourself. And they show him where the linens are laying down. Go and tell his disciples what you have seen. Verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. They run from the tomb filled with fear and with joy. They are scared. They are confused, but they are excited and they are hopeful and they run and Jesus meets them there. He greets them and they fall at his feet and they worship him. Preacher, I'm really glad that you're sharing all these things with us today. I really like your new Easter shirt. Thank you very much. But what on earth does this have to do with me in my life right here and right now today? What does all this have to do with Easter? And so we come to celebrate Easter because Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive, then I want to follow him with all that I am. And what we see here in these first few verses are things that we are all going to experience in our life if we follow Christ. Things like what? Well, first we see this realistic route of following Jesus is often very surprising. If you want to make the Lord have a giggle, you wake up in the morning, you tell him what you're going to do that day. Oh, that's funny. That's what you think. You see, the truth is that when we follow Christ in obedience, we're going to go places and see things, and do things, and have experiences that we never even thought possible in our life. Because it is a surprising journey of obedience. Just as the women were surprised by what they found. The realistic route is where God shows up. For eight weeks, we have walked through Old Testament accounts of David and Goliath and Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho. And in every single account that we looked at, there was one common theme. Men and women stepped out in faith when they had no idea what they were doing, but they trusted the Lord anyway, and God showed up. The women didn't know what they were doing. How are we going to get in the tomb? What happens when we get there if it's closed? We don't know. We just know we're supposed to be there. And when they got there, guess what? God had showed up. To the realistic route has stones that are being rolled away. We all have walls in our life that need to be broken down. We have barriers that need to be demolished. And there is no wall and there is no barrier in this life that can ever keep us from the love of Christ. So there's a great misconception that the angel came to roll the stone away so that Jesus could get out. Jesus didn't need an angel to roll a stone away for him to get out. The reason that the stone was rolled away was so that we could get in. So we could see that he is risen and he was not there. The realistic route is filled with fear and with joy. They were excited. Christ is not here. He is risen. Praise the Lord. Then they take off running and they're scared to death. What does this mean? What happens next? Where do we go? What do we do? That's the same path that we follow in this life. There's going to be days that we are filled with fear and times that we are filled with joy. Times of excitement, times of sorrow, times of bliss, times of struggle. But one thing never, ever changes. The realistic route says we will never be alone. You remember what the angel said? Do not be afraid. What did Jesus say when they met him and they worshipped him and they bowed down at his feet? Do not be afraid. So Jesus rose from the dead. 
That can't really be true, can it? Could it really be possible that he died a physical death and was walking around, flesh and blood, bone and muscle, alive, breath in his lungs, beats in his heart? There must be some explanation. So one theory is, well, of course it was the disciples and they stole his body. Well, in case you haven't read the backstory to this, when Jesus was being arrested and beaten and crucified, you know where the disciples were? Hiding. They were scared and they were running. Do you think all of a sudden after Jesus died that they had this boldness and this faith and now they're going to storm the tomb? I don't think so. And if they had stolen the body, do you think that their lives would have changed from when they went to a place of fear and hiding to a place of boldness and martyrdom waiting To die for their faith? No way. Well, then it must have been a criminal. Criminals went and they stole the body of Jesus. They thought they could sell it to someone. Have you ever known a criminal to steal a body? I hope not. That takes the time to take the linens off? That doesn't make any sense. They would have taken the body, linens, and all. Well, then it must have been the Jewish leaders. They stole the body so the disciples couldn't try to, you know, pull a trick on anybody. They didn't want to steal the body. They wanted the body there that way. They could say, yeah, that's your Jesus who says he was God's son. He's dead. They wanted that proof. Maybe they went to the wrong tomb. They went to a tomb and it wasn't the right one, so that's the reason Jesus wasn't there. Well, if that was correct, then they would know where the right tomb was. The Jewish leaders would say, oh, no, Jesus is over here. Let me show you where he's at so that you can know he is dead. And that wouldn't explain the transformation of the disciples or of Saul. Maybe he just passed out. Maybe that was it. Maybe he fell asleep, he was exhausted, he'd been beaten, he'd lost so much blood. He passed out, and then he woke up in the tomb, he knocked on it, they opened it up, they let him out. He didn't pass out. He was dead. They pierced his side, and the blood and the water came out separate. His heart no longer had beats in it. He was dead. It must have been a hallucination. Well, hallucinations happen one person at a time. Now we're the whole group, and Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time. So it could have been a hallucination. And if it was, that wouldn't have changed the disciples and the followers because they were changed after they saw a resurrected Christ. Dr. Gary Habermas, he wrote over 20 books just on the resurrection of Christ. And he has this conclusion. God gives us enough information to convince us, but not to convert us. And if the resurrection is true, then the gospel is true. And if the gospel is true... Christianity is true, but without the resurrection, we have no hope and we have no truth. Here's the realistic route for everyone in this room. You either believe that Jesus rose or that he's still in the tomb. You either believe that he is the Son of God or he is not. You believe that he is dead or you believe that he is alive. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is alive. Number two, we see the returning robber, verse 11. So while they were going, behold, some of the guards, they went into the city. They told the chief priests exactly what had taken place. The women are on their way to go and to see the disciples and tell them that Christ has risen and he will meet them in Galilee. And the guards, the soldiers, are so uncertain about what they do next because Jesus is gone. He is not there. They had one job and they failed. So they go and they speak to the leaders and the elders, those who are religious. Verse 12. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell me, tell people this. His disciples came by night. They stole him away while we were sleeping. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him. We will keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and they did just as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So the chief priests, the religious leaders, they come up with this plan. Okay, soldiers, this is what you are going to do. You're going to go back and you're going to tell everybody that you fell asleep. And while you were sleeping, the disciples came and they stole the body of Jesus. Not only is this a lie, but it's really a bad lie. Because if they really were sleeping, how on earth would it be possible they could know what happened to the body of Jesus? But if you look at this from the soldier's perspective, they got two options. Okay, Option A, we go tell our boss that Jesus is gone and we will be executed. Because it wasn't like you got demoted. It wasn't like something happened to where, you know, you just got a small punishment. 
you absolutely got executed if you failed your job as a Roman soldier. So option A, we tell the truth and we die. That's a bad option. We're not going with that. Option B, we tell this story that the religious leaders want us to tell. If we get caught or get in trouble, they're going to have our backs and we get paid. Victory, that's what I'm talking about. I'm going with option B. Option A, execution. Option B, make some money, tell a little bit of story, and we're safe. I'm going road number two. So they took the money, they told the lie, and it's still being told today. 2,000 years ago this happened, but lies are all around us. People are still being influenced by half lives and half truths that they tell to protect themselves. The guilty are still looking for ways not to be held accountable. The innocent are being taken advantage of by smooth talkers and finger pointers, and the lost are still being blinded to the truth that Jesus is alive. Mike Satterfield says this when he preaches. There's two kinds of people that are in this room today. One, you know that Jesus is alive. Or two, there are those who are about to know that Jesus is alive. A or B. And so maybe today, if you've never given your life to Christ, and you're not sure that he is alive, I want to warn you that there is an enemy in this life who has an army whose purpose and goal is to keep you from knowing the truth. And he is a returning robber. He will come back to you time and time again. And he wants to steal your hope and your love and your joy, your forgiveness and your salvation. He will tell you absolutely anything to convince you that Jesus is dead. Don't believe him. But if you're in this place and you do believe that Jesus is alive, he's after you too. And he will whisper in your ear because he wants to do anything to distract you from the light and to pull you into the darkness. He wants to steal your joy, your intention, your fellowship, your worship, your closeness to Christ, your devotion, and your peace. See, what is Easter all about? It's about knowing that Jesus is alive and there is absolutely nothing that anyone can say or can do to ever take us away from his love. Number three, we have the reassuring rock. Young Timmy was six years old. He had five days until his seventh birthday, and he was some kind of excited about that. So every night before he went to bed, he would say his prayers, and his mom noticed that as his birthday got closer, he began to pray a little bit louder and a little bit louder and a little bit louder. So after about three or four days before his birthday, she was listening, and from the kitchen, she could hear him all the way down the hall, and as he's praying, he's telling the Lord every single thing that he would like to get for his birthday. So she calls in, she says, honey, you don't have to pray so loud. But day three, two days out, one day out, and he is still used to praying at the top of his lungs, the neighbors could hear. So she goes in, she taps him on the shoulder, and she says, Honey, you don't have to pray so loud because Jesus isn't deaf. And he looks up at her with his six-year-old eyes, and he says, Oh, Mama, I know that Jesus isn't deaf, but Grandma's down the hall, and she is. (laughs) See, he wanted to assure and to reassure that Grandma knew what he wanted for his birthday. So he's going to say it over and over again real loud. Sometimes we want to assure and reassure ourselves that we know and believe that Jesus is alive. Verse 16. Now the eleven disciples, they went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They're on their way. They are being obedient. Exactly what he told them to do. Go to Galilee. I'll meet you there. They're on the way. They seem. This is it. Jesus is alive. And some believed and some doubted. You see, this is a testament to the accuracy and the integrity of Scripture. If this book was made up, there wouldn't be sentences in there like that. It would just say, everybody saw and everybody believed. Period. End of story. But instead, it gives us the truth. There were many that believed, but there were some that still doubted. And maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you really want to believe, but you still have these doubts. Could Jesus really raise from the dead? Can he really save me? Could he forgive me? Could he love me? Verse 18. And Jesus came and he said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All authority on heaven and earth. Jesus had that, but the resurrection absolutely proves it. And he gives us some command. Go and make disciples. And that word go, there's the Greek verb, pour you am I. And it does not mean go on Tuesdays at 5.30. It doesn't mean go once a month and tell people about Jesus. Go means as you go, while you are going. As you travel from home to work, from work to the restaurant, from the restaurant to the ball field, from the ball field to the grocery store, and from the grocery store back home. As you travel throughout this life, you are called to make disciples, which means that you are to call people to commit to Jesus as master and Lord of their life. You're called to get them baptized and to encourage them to follow through with this outward symbol of an inward change. You're to do it in the name of the name, singular, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has taught them. And one last thing, you'll never be alone. I will always be with you. What he's pointing to here is a process. He's saying evangelism isn't a one-time event or an activity. Sharing your faith is a lifestyle. And so you don't do it when you go on Tuesday at 12 or when you go on Friday at 9, but as you go. So when you leave here today and when you go to your house and when you go to work tomorrow, every day, all day long, as you go, you're to make disciples. You're to invest in people's lives and build relationships. You are to tell them about who Jesus is and what he has done for you in your life. You're to encourage them to make that commitment you're to walk through them when they get baptized. And then you're to help teach them what you know about the Bible and what more they can learn. And it's a process. And so few people walk through it. Nine out of ten confessing believers in Christ will never tell another person about Jesus' great love. Ninety percent will never say a single word. And so many times we have this need for assurance. I just want to know that God is walking with me. I want to know that I know that I know that I'm in the midst of his will. And so he says, here's my plan for you. I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to tell other people about who I am and what I have done. I want you to walk through them and disciple them and show them what the Bible says or what they can learn and learn with them as they go. And I want you to invest in their lives. And then the most amazing thing will happen in your life. You're going to become more like Jesus. And the more you become like Jesus, the closer you're going to feel to Jesus. And then the more assurance and faith that you will have that he is absolutely real and alive. But the problem is that I can't tell you about something that I don't know about. I can't tell you how comfortable a pair of shoes are until I've worn those shoes. I can't tell you about how much I like a new song until I've heard it or until I've sung it. And some of you have never tasted and seen just how good that Jesus is, so you can't tell other people. But what about the ones of us who have tasted and seen? What does it mean when we are not telling other people about how good he is? We had a family friend give us this piece of technology several moons ago, and this is my friend, A-L-E-X-A. -E she knows almost everything in the world. You can ask her almost any question. Alexa, what is the longest word in the dictionary? The longest word in an English dictionary is pneumonoeltromicroscopic silica volcano coniosis, defined as an artificial long word said to mean a lung disease caused by inhaling very fine ash and sand dust. It has 45 letters. I knew that. Surely y'all knew that. Alexa, what is the largest city in the world? The largest city is Tokyo. Alexa, what is the fastest car in the world? The fastest car by top speed is the 2017 Koenigsegg Gear RS at 277.87 miles per hour. Babe, my birthday's coming in June. It's just saying. <laughs> Alexa, how many calories are in a large pepperoni pizza? There are 2,400 calories in one large pepperoni pizza. Praise the Lord. 
Alexa, how many inches are in a mile? I might have missed part of what you said. Alexa, if you want. Alexa, how many inches are in a mile? One mile equals 63,360 inches. How about this? Alexa, how do I get to heaven? Sorry, I'm not sure. Alexa, how do I get to heaven? Sorry, I'm not sure. She knows so many things, but she doesn't know how to get to heaven. So the three men stood before St. Peter and he asked them one question. And so if you were standing before the Lord today, and he asked you one question, and the question was, why should I let you into heaven? Do you know what your answer would be? Because for many people, the answer would sound something like this. Well, I've tried to live a really good life. I've tried to do more for others than for myself. I've tried to let my good outweigh my bad. I've helped, I've served, I've given, I've forgiven. And yet Ephesians 2 very clearly says that we are only saved by grace through faith, not by our works, because then we could boast about it. So if it's not about how good I am or about how many good things that I do in this life, then how is it that I can be saved? So I want you to imagine that this hand today represents you and it represents me. And in this hand, there are a lot of really good things. We have jobs and we have families. We have loved, we have given, we have served. We've taken the shirts off our back. We've given our last dime to somebody that needed it more than us. We have been selfish and sacrificial. There are many, many good things in our life. But there's also many bad things that are in our life. And they are black and they are dark. These are all of our sins, all of our guilt, all of our deception, all of our lies. This is everything that is in my life that I don't want anybody else to know that I have ever done or thought. And that's called sin. And God Almighty is in heaven above. And because God is so good and because He loves us, because He is a good Father that is just, He holds us accountable for the things that are in our life. And so he sees all the wrong that we have ever done. And it causes a distance between us because there is an offense to our sin. So God came up with this plan to where he sent Jesus to come to this earth. And what Jesus did was, because we were sheep who went astray, he took our iniquities upon himself. And he took our sin from us and he washed it away forever. He paid the price on a cross. He went into the tomb. And three days later, he rose again. And he went back into the presence of the Father. And he wants nothing more than for us to have a relationship with him. But he is a gentleman. So he does not force us to choose to follow him. Instead, he lets us make a personal decision. But too often we say, well, I can make that decision next week or next month or next year. When the truth is that today is not even guaranteed. So I would like to give you some eternal urgency today. That if this were your last day to live, do you know how you would answer God if he asked you? Why would I let you into heaven? Because the goodness of trusting Jesus as your Savior is not only the power of forgiveness of sins and eternal life, but it will transform your daily life. Amen. Everything about you, your mental life, your emotional life, your physical life, will all be changed when you make that decision. See, the resurrection road shows us that there is a realistic route that we're going to follow, and it's not easy, but it's worth it. There is a returning robber who will whisper in our ears, don't you think about listening to what he has to say. And we have a reassuring rock that we can stand on for eternity. 
So I pray today that as you walk this road of life that you would know without a shadow of a doubt what you will say to God one day when you stand before him. I pray that you are absolutely certain of where you're going to spend eternity and that you know, that you know, that you know that Jesus is alive. 